Welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Theological Seminary series of podcasts on church history. Perhaps the most significant figure in the history of the 17th century church in Scotland, and perhaps even subsequently, was Samuel Rutherford, born in the year 1600 and died in the year 16. 61. By any accounts, Rutherford was an extraordinary and remarkable man. This is what one of his contemporaries wrote about him. I have known many great and good ministers in this church, but for such a piece of clay as Mr Rutherford was, I never knew one in Scotland like him, to whom so many great gifts were given, for he seemed to be altogether taken up with everything good and excellent and useful. He seemed to be always praying, always preaching, always visiting the sick, always catechising, always writing and studying. Many times I thought he would have flown out of the pulpit when he came to speak of Jesus Christ. He was never in his right element. But when he was commending him, he would have fallen asleep in bed, speaking of Christ. Now, however much this is an idealised portrait of Rutherford, there is no denying that he was one of the most significant figures in the life of Puritan Scotland or covenanting Scotland. The early decades of the 17th century in Scotland were marked by the Crown through compliant bishops seeking, seeking to bring the Reformed Church under Episcopal authority. The heady days of Presbyterian supremacy um, under men like Andrew Melville um, were increasingly a distant memory. And through the five Articles of Perth, 1618, uh, James I, the Sixth of Scotland, first of the United Kingdom, uh, sought to bring the church into conformity with royal supremacy. Rutherford was born then into a church that he would later call Our Harlot Mother. He went to university in 1617, where he excelled in Latin and Greek. And like John Calvin before him, and like almost every significant figure in the first 18 centuries of the Christian church, we actually know very, very little about the circumstances of his conversion. There are possibly only two, perhaps three, but certainly two references to his conversion in all his writings. In a letter of 1637, he, he writes to a Robert Stuart Ye have gotten a great advantage in the way of heaven, that ye have started to the gate in the morning. Fool as I was, I suffered my son to be high in the heaven and near afternoon before I ever took the gate by the end. The second reference enables us perhaps to pin down the timing of his conversion somewhat. In a, late, a letter to Lady Kenmure, uh, 1636, he writes... That honour that I have prayed for these sixteen years, with submission to my Lord's will, my kind Lord hath now bestowed upon me, even to suffer for my royal and princely King Jesus, and for his kingly crown, and for the freedom of his kingdom that his Father hath given him. And so it's reasonable to assume that Rutherford was around twenty years of age, when he was brought to saving faith in Jesus Christ. The early years of the 1620s are somewhat shrouded in mystery, mystery regarding Rutherford. He was dismissed from his university teaching position and the Edinburgh City Council records mention a charge of fornication with a woman who later became his wife. There is, I think, a problem here. This is not to attempt in any way to whitewash Rutherford. The Bible never does that with men and women of faith. And at times, indeed, the Bible draws our attention in somewhat striking ways to the egregious sins 
of God's saints. But there is a problem, I think, because shortly after this, Rutherford is inducted into the charge of Anworth. And if there had been such a moral blot on Rutherford's life, it seems strange in the extreme that so soon after this, a year or so, he would have been inducted to the charge of Anworth. Um, one uh, renowned scholar suggests that actually um, Rutherford had enemies. Rutherford was passionate Presbyterian at a day when the church was under Episcopal oversight. He, he spoke um, passionately against Episcopacy. And one scholar thinks that perhaps behind the charges was an animus uh, from Rutherford's enemies. But be that as is may, in 1627 Rutherford was ordained and inducted to the charge with which his name will be inseparably uh, connected, Anworth by the Solway. The fact that he was inducted without giving engagement to the bishop, as he writes, provides, I think, the first striking example of a principle that would run like a golden thread through Rutherford's life, truth before consequences. The bishop was compliant. He didn't insist that, that Rutherford acknowledge Episcopal oversight. But he was a man who sought with unyielding faithfulness to serve his Lord and Saviour. And it's a reminder to us that we ought never to play the game of ecclesiastical statesmanship in the hope that evangelical influence can be promoted via the altar of ecclesiastical compromise. We are ever to obey God rather than men. For the next nine or so years, Rutherford ministered happily and effectively in Anworth. During this time, his first wife died after a long and sore illness and his two children. Rutherford was no stranger to personal grief and suffering and the comfort his ministry would later bring to others was forged in the fires of his own personal sufferings. When a new bishop was installed uh, in Galloway in 1635, Rutherford came under increasing pressure to conform to Episcopal authority and he refuses to do so. He wrote, our prelate will have us either to swallow our light over and digest it contrary to our stomachs, how be it we should vomit our conscience, or then he will try if deprivation can convert us to the ceremonial faith. 27th July 1636, Rutherford is removed from his charge and exiled to Aberdeen, somewhat of an Episcopal stronghold. He wrote in a letter, next to Christ I had but one joy, the apple of my eye and my delights to preach Christ my Lord, and they have violently plucked that away from me. It was during this time of exile, this 18 months or so exile, that Rutherford wrote 220 of his 365 extant letters. So if Satan had intended to silence Rutherford, Actually, God's sovereign overruling wisdom turned for good what Satan intended for evil. John MacLeod described Rutherford's letters as the most remarkable series of devotional letters that the literature of the Reformed Church can show. And even Richard Baxter, who was no friend of Rutherford's to say the least, could write, hold off the Bible, such a book of Mr Rutherford's letters, the world never saw the like. With the advent of the National Covenant in 1638, a new dawn heralded for Christ's cause in Scotland. In June, Rutherford returned to Anworth, but only one year later the General Assembly appointed him to the strategic position of Professor of Divinity at Anworth. He wrote, my removal from my flock is so heavy to me that it maketh my life a burden to me. The Lord help and uphold sad clay 
in our next podcast, we will continue to uh, reflect on the life and significance of Samuel Rutherford.